are from the Pittsburgh area? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people are from Chapel Hill? Okay, anybody from Durham? Raleigh? Raise your hand. Clayton, just outside of Raleigh. I know, but there's a lot of you. Yeah, far away. Thank you for coming this far. Um, so it's great to have you guys here. Um, we've got a lot of good stuff to do, and what we're going to do now is just go through kind of what we're going to do as an agenda. Um, I want to underscore, and I'm sure Liz will support this, if you have a question, don't wait. Uh, ask it. Any question is fair game. Um, even how I tie my bow tie, anything you want to ask. Um, this is, I'm going to a Christmas party after this. This is my little Christmas color. Um, so uh, I don't usually get this formally dressed up, but I'm pleased to be here dressed with my bow tie. But um, ask the question when it's fresh, because if you're thinking it, probably somebody else's. Don't be afraid to ask. Um, we've got a lot of content. Um, we're going to do introductions. I'm going to get Liz to get up here and do her intro, just so you know who she is. And, where she's from, I'm going to then do mine. Then we're going to talk about how to scale your business and some principles about that. Then Liz is going to do some real hands-on workshops with you in the room so you get a real hands-on feel of what design thinking is like. And I'll let her talk about what those are and how it works uh, for two key parts of your business. And then I'll finish the content and then we'll open up for q &A. So uh, any questions on the agenda? Okay, feel free to keep moving. We work with SBTDC. I don't know if you know what SBTDC is. 
a small business that runs the development center, and we work with accountants and lawyers and other resources in the community to help you get what you need. So uh, I've been a SCORE mentor for now going on seven and a half years. I've also mentored with the Council for Entrepreneurial Development and their Venture Mentoring Service for High Tech and Life Sciences. I've been a scrub, his scrub coach for um, Launch Chapel Hill. I work with Tim Floyd, Tim Flood, and a lot of other people in the community. So I'm really excited to give back to the community by teaching and also mentoring our clients. So with that, um, and just from a, yes ma'am. Sorry, can you just say a, a word about, I'm just curious, the SBA, are you talking about the national SBA? Are you working in conjunction with the local SBA? Since you're a local SBA person here? Both. Um, the SBA nationally underwrites the entire nonprofit called SCORE.org. And we work with local SBA offices across the country for advice on SBA loan support and other things like that. So but you're not tapping the local SBA money, you're using all the national money. No, the, the, the SBA money we get is, is very small and supports a minor thread of what we do. Everything we do is free, I don't get paid, I'm a volunteer. And then we connect clients to the SBA for advice that they may need or resources or referrals to SBA related banks or programs like 8A loans or Series 7 loans or other things like that. Great question, thank you. Um, so yeah, we are a, an SBA supporter of these issues. Uh, often asked to say that. Anyways, I was just gonna say a little bit more about me. I'm not a PhD, I have an MBA and a bachelor's degree in engineering. I've worked for 34 years for Hewlett Packard and I'm known as what's uh, in some Corners as an entrepreneur. I started two businesses from scratch inside HP. The second one I helped start when we had zero revenue, zero customers, zero market presence, grew to over a billion dollars of revenue before I retired. So I've been there from the beginning. We're going, we got to find somebody to buy the stuff. And all the way up to, oh gosh, we're getting too big for our bridges and we're not making the kind of money we expect to, oh, now we're global, so global expansion, product service line expansion, customer expansion. I've lived through a lot of that, sweated a bunch of, it took a lot of arrows getting there. So, um, and then locally, our own chapter, what I wanted to say earlier, you can get to score.org or www.score.org or to our local chapter, local mentors, with the uh, added uh, uh, characters at the end of the added address. Um, on that website, there are online seminars, on-demand webinars, scheduled materials, and a whole host of templates, financial templates on how to do startup expenses, um, pro forma expense con uh, stuff, business plan templates, just a variety of stuff that you may be looking for. And as an example, very current classes, um, we're gonna be offering them locally in the future, but online, there's already a classroom score on how to use ChatGPT and artificial intelligence in your business, which is very current, and, and there's pros and cons and dangers of that, so it's important that our clients understand and, and how to use you know, current kind of technology like that. So our local chapter serves Orange, Durham, and Chatham counties, including Pittsburgh and the surrounding area. We also go out to Alamance, and sometimes get referrals from um, north of Durham, sort of between southern Virginia and north Durham. We get some people who come in the middle. We have chapters in Raleigh, Greensboro, Bloomington, Asheville, and Charlotte, and, uh, and in the Piedmont. So um, we cover the state and we're the local chapter here. Any questions about SCORE? I'll just get going. All right. So what is scaling? We talked about scaling your business. Actually, let me stop for a second. I have a question. How many people here who are in the class are in business today right now? Okay. Almost all of them. Now let me go back and define what being in business means. Who knows the definition of being in business? When you raised your hand, you thought you knew. <laughs> Melissa, what is being Getting in business? Money from whatever it is you're doing. Get it, did you hear what she said? Getting money from whatever you're doing. Saying you have a website and you're starting to try to find customers is not being in business. You're not in business until someone pays you for what you're offering, and ideally at a price that makes money for you, right? So if you're in business already, you're here probably because you're trying to grow your business and you may be having challenges or want to know what to anticipate as you grow. So let's talk about what scaling means since we threw in the title. 
Scaling your business means can you and how do you grow your sales efficiently and effectively? That's often what a venture capital will think about capitalism. How are you going to scale? How are you going to get big without losing money? In fact, if you were to summarize this whole slide, it's how do you grow profitably? Anybody can grow a business. The real question of scale is how do you get big and make money while you're doing it? And these are all the questions. You grow your sales without adding resources. You can lower your cost to acquire a customer. You can increase your average order size so you get more profitable. You can increase the retention of existing and new customers, which is critical to scale. If you have to go out and keep finding new customers because you're losing more than you find, you're not scaling your business. Okay? Um, you get more margin. Everybody knows what margin is, right? For each incremental sale, for each unit of time, where you get your simplified your operations. These are all dimensions of scale. Anybody have another definition or something on their mind when they think of scaling? Or does that cover what you all think? For you guys who are in business, when you're thinking about scaling your business, what are your biggest challenges? What's your, of these or something else, what are you wrestling with? Finance. Finance. And what do you mean by scaling Access to finance? What? Access to capital. Okay. Anybody else? That's a good one. We're going to have to talk about finance a little bit. Um, so my takeaway is ultimately to scale your business, you need a systematic way not just a random way, a systematic way to grow revenue, which is the top line, and improve profit. And ideally, if you're going to try to get investors, a demonstrated and systematic way. A systematic way on paper is one thing. A demonstrated one means you've shown that you can do it consistently. So someone's going to say, I can see that this business is going to grow and make money because you've already demonstrated you're on that path of growth. You're smiling. Is There's there a <laughs> So another way to think about it is when you're running your business in the beginning, and I'm using high-tech words, but this applies to anybody. In the very beginning, you're trying to get your MVP, your minimum viable product for your business off the ground. First product, your first offering, your first website. And once you get that, you think you've got something to sell to people, the next stop is how do I find my first maybe 10 or 100 customers? And if you can find 100 customers that buy the product or service you want, your next question is how do I get the next one? To keep growing, right? But getting those first, remember I told you when I started, I'll give you a quick story. I'll never forget, we had a little program called 642. The 642 program was we were starting a business in services for corporate enterprise customers, and nothing was happening with our sales team. And all of a sudden, Sam said, in 90 days, we need six proposals, we need six customers identified or qualified to buy our service. We need four of them to ask for a proposal. We need two of them to give us money. It was literally that kind of ground level, I need to find customers who are going to pay us for the service or I'm going out of business. All right? That's not as easy as it sounds. And then scaling is the next way. All right? Another way of thinking about it in, in marketing terms is first you have to validate that you have a problem and a solution fit, meaning the problem you're solving for your customers and what you solve with your solution is a fit. Because that's number one. Don't solve a problem that no one wants, doesn't want solved. So there's a real problem out there, you've got a real solution. Then, sales and product market fit is, do you have a product in, in the market where the customers in the segment you're going after really want what you want and prefer it over the existing alternatives that are out there? Because you could have a solution to a problem, but it's not better than the existing alternatives, which means your product market fit is weak, and you're not going to get scaled because you're not going to win customers. And then the last thing, if you get that going, the next thing is what's the process to keep it going? If it's selling, marketing, operations, etc. And that's what scaling is about, is getting out of just testing for fit and moving to scaling and keep it going. Another way to think about it is three questions. First, do we have a better solution? Is it feasible? Can I solve that problem? Second, is it viable? Are there customers out there who will buy it and pay me money for it? And third, can I sustain that? Can I sustain it, meaning can I do it with the current funds I have, or do I have to go get money from somebody else because I'm getting sales, but all my cash is tied up in inventory? Or I'm getting sales, but I'm losing customers as fast as I'm getting, or I'm getting returns. Something's not scalable. And so the sustainability is really the question of going 
this point, maybe. Another way of thinking about it, again, these are kind of Silicon Valley terms. Everybody know the term track burn? Yeah. Okay, when you're starting a business, cash is so precious. So when we say tracking the burn, the first step is, I've only got a little bit of cash, and I better keep track of that little pile of cash and only spend it on the things that are really important. Because if I run out of cash before I get going and get customers, I'm dead before I start. So you track burn first. Then once you get customers and they're giving you money, and maybe you're making money or bringing cash in, cash isn't the most important thing. It's, am I growing at the right rate? Can I track that? And then later, am I really making money? And you guys have all seen in high-tech examples, people that give things away to get customers, free downloads, etc. They're not making money. They're just trying to get growth. But at some point, that customer has to start giving them money for their business so that they can make money to stay in business by having enough margin to cover the cost of running that business. So that's the idea. Where do you focus it? Um, how many of you are in growth mode right now? You're growing fast, you're growing, and you're trying to manage it. What you, can I ask what your business is now? Oh, sorry. I was not attention. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Anybody else want to share what business they're in and what, what growth they're seeing? I'm itty bitty growth. I'm a landscape designer uh -huh. and garden designer, so I'm, I'm getting some customers. You're getting some customers. Okay, great. So let's talk about the different dimensions of scale. I, I put five categories, including money. Um, leadership and management of your organization, sales and marketing, operations, finance, and technology. Now, one of these is the most important if you have more than yourself as an employee. Which one is it? Sales and marketing. Say again? Sales and marketing. Sales and marketing? Anybody have another guess? Leadership and management. Robert so leadership, says leadership and management. Leadership and management. And why do you say that? Because everything else falls apart without it. Everything falls apart without it. So that's number one, we'll talk about that. Number two is sales. And those are the two key, two, two key things in scaling your business. Robert's point is really important. That if your leadership model, and we'll talk about what does it mean to be leading to scale, falls apart, everything else in our business is going to fall apart. If you can't tell your salespeople where to point their time, or how to manage it, or you don't train people properly, it don't matter how much technology or operations efficiency you have. You're shaking your head, yeah? That is my business. That's leadership, your business? Leadership and team building yeah. is what I do. So I'm selling for her now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's, let's, let's get into that. And by the way, here's a visual of what I call this. I hope this is a simple idea that you've got, which is a body plus a process is better than just adding lots of bodies. You follow that? A body and a process for scale is better than lots of bodies. And ideally, if that process is supported by appropriate technology, you might be able to scale faster, okay? But a lot of companies start throwing bodies at the problem. Oh, we're growing, let's have another salesperson. I need someone else to help me. And you start throwing bodies at the problem. And at some point, not necessarily in the very beginning, you've got to pause and say, is this sustainable? Do we really understand what we're doing? Do we have a process for what we're doing so we can repeat it and grow? Because particularly for small businesses, hiring a body can be very expensive, and they better darn well be very productive. And to me, the simplest way to think about it is if you're not hiring a salesperson, whoever you're hiring better be helping you generate more than enough margin, not revenue, to cover the expense of that person. The minute you start adding people that I'll make up another 50000 a year, and they only contribute $25,000 a year of revenue or cost reduction, that's a recipe for going out of business. Because cash is king and you can't afford to pay them. So it doesn't matter whether they're sales or operations, if they're not generating incremental revenue and or margin reduction, cost savings, it's greater than what you're paying them. Or you have deep pockets for investors who are patient, you go out of business fast. All right, so let's talk about some ideas for scaling leadership management. In fact, some of these I got from venture capitalists who were on an investor call, and I asked them directly, what do you think about scaling? And they brought up leadership and management. So first, you need a culture that has consistent expectations, particularly if there's employed two through N. As your organization grows, decision-making needs to be to the central. 
happens if everything has to go through the owner, the founder, the CEO, the president, to get anything done, this organization will crumble quickly and get stuck in the mud. You can't scale your business if you don't trust the people who are working for you and you can delegate to them the things that you're not good at or why you hire them. The minute you get in the middle of making every decision and micromanaging is the beginning of the downfall. So to Robert's point, it all starts here. And then some other things you need to think about is what are the operating principles that complement your mission and vision and values so that those principles start getting into the mind of employee number one, two, and X to drive consistency and behavior. And then if you're going to have bad people on the people leadership side, the scale challenge becomes, do I know what I'm hiring for? And am I hiring consistently for that? Because if you don't know what you're hiring for, you're going to start getting a mishmash of people with different values and different styles. And different styles and inclusion is fine. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about robots where everybody's the same. But you need to know that you're hiring for a reason and why and how those people fit into the business and define that recruiting process so that other people than yourself can get involved. And then that starts to scale. Other people help you hire. Do you have a repeatable onboarding and training process? If you bring someone on and you can't repeatedly predict what they need to get trained on, they're going to start doing things that you may or may not approve of or inconsistent with the company's values, missions, or operating principles. So you've got to start at some point defining repeatable processes. And then for people, you know, you get really messy quickly if you go out and pay someone a lot of money to try to from somewhere else. And then the next person comes on the board and says, well, they're a director and I want to be a director and I want to be paid director level. And before you know it, you got all this infighting because you haven't defined the career path and some sort of consistent pay structure. That over time could not seek you, but take a lot of your time away. So having a clear vision of what kind of people am I adding, how am I paying them, what do I value, how do I bring them on board, and how do I set expectations, foundations of managing people is going to help you drive scale. Because at some point you're going to have to let go as an entrepreneur. And let somebody else do things you don't do well, and that lets you scale. Because then you can spend your time on important things, whether it's getting customers, or designing a new product, or going out for financing because you're the owner, and that takes time, etc. Ultimately, you want to be able to measure that. Some simple metrics for how am I doing my reports. Questions, feedback, comments on leadership and management. Yes, Steve. This is uh, not exactly relevant, but after reading the Elon Musk biography by Walter Isaacson, he managed to violate practically every one of those rules in one form or another, especially from someone starting from a scratch with SpaceX or Tesla or whatever. So I'm just curious as to how you overcome that kind of personality to do the thing. I, the question was, how do you overcome a personality like Elon Musk and I can't read Isaacson's book, so I can't comment? I would say these principles are not guarantees. These are things that increase the likelihood that you'll scale your business to success. There are always exceptions, and you know, brute force, tons of money, you're the third richest man on earth, or whatever. You can do a lot of things different to get away with it, and I can't comment. I just listened to an hour and a half interview of Elon Musk by Andrew Ross Sorkin at the, the, the yeah. conference. That, but, so he's a real interesting cat. But I think when you start listening to what I'm sharing, it's really to increase the likelihood that you're successful. There are no guarantees. All right? Other questions on leadership? More just a comment. Yeah. People hate Elon Musk, even that work for him. They're working for Tesla, <laughs> not Elon Musk. So, you know, it's, it's more of a... These principles are are important, but people, I mean, I know people that work at Tesla and they work at Tesla and put it on the resume. So it's like working at Facebook or working at Meta or you know, any of those big co top companies now. If you put it on your resume and you're more likely to get hired for other companies, it's the same thing with Tesla. They're not working for Elon, they hate Elon Musk. Yeah, and, and, and not to pick on any other big company, but as an example, remember I talked about retention and, and how do you keep people? For a while, I know, I know a guy who's a very senior HR guy at Amazon. And for the longest time, you didn't even have to interview to go to Amazon at any distribution center. You walk in, 
You don't even have to take a drug test. If you show up and you want to work, they'll put you on the line. If you perform, you stay. If you not, you leave. But you know what happened after a while? They found out that they were running out of people to hire in most of their metro areas because they were turning over people so quickly because they were burning them out. And then someone in HR realized, gee, maybe we should spend a little time retaining the people we have and have career paths for them so they can grow because there aren't enough people. Literally, if you scaled the growth of Amazon, there aren't enough people in each of the major metros that they had at the rate they were going. And so they woke up to it late because it cost them it became an inhibitor on growth because they didn't have those things. So that's a counter example, Steve, of another great company that had some challenges. All right, sales and marketing. This is number two, really important. I'm going to go a little more on this and then we'll jump into um, Liz's first exercise. Sales and marketing. You need a repeatable, documented sales process. Repeatable sales process means if I call on this kind of client for landscape architecture, and I give them this kind of pitch, they likely will say, yes, I want to buy your services. Repeatable sales processes, I know the customer well enough that when I give them the pitch of the features, advantages, and benefits of the service or product I'm selling, they're very likely to say yes. That's what repeatable is. That doesn't mean you can't sell to other people. It doesn't mean if someone who's not your target audience comes with a bucket of money and says, I want to buy you, say no. But until you have a repeatable sales process, you're not going to scale your revenue because you're going to be all over the place trying to do that. So the, the way you do that is you define your ideal customer profile. Who would ideally want to do my services? High-end landscaping, low-end landscaping. Are these two people with homes of a half an acre or more? Are they in the city? Are they in the country? Are they retired? Are they working? Are they income over 100 grand? What is it about this customer? and how they think about landscape architecture, I'm using your example, Melissa, that tells me they're the ideal customer. And I gotta find them, and I gotta practice this pitch until I get it right, and then they start saying yes. And then what do I do next? I find more of the same people. I don't make another pitch, I don't go up with our customers, I find as many of those people who look like, smell like, sound like that ideal customer, and keep selling until I can't find them more. That's the fastest way to grow. That's the fastest way. Now these other things, as this book is repeat, these other things are other things to do in sales and marketing to leverage that over time. If you start getting customers that you sold them on the original landscape design, uh, an upsell would be the installation. A cross-sell might be other services, right? So cross-selling and upselling, once I've got them, keeps the business going and grows your revenue without having to find a new customer. That's why we say invest in cross selling or selling. And then ideally, define how you're going to keep those customers over time. Are you going to offer an annual maintenance service or a refresh where you go out in the spring and the fall and do certain things for the yard to keep that beautiful landscape the way it was the day you left it, the first time you installed it? That's a, you know, what's the outcome you want for those customers when you're doing it? Okay? I'm, I'm going to not spend a lot of time marketing, but these are foundational marketing things. And marketing helps sales, right? But when you're starting and you're small, marketing is really in support of sales. This is not corporate branding. You could do that, logos, domain names, websites. Do what you need to do to get your clear identity set. But most of your marketing should be in service to sales and media. Get your name out there to find customers. Do you have a lead generation process? Where did I put that? A lead generation process, which would be defined by marketing. Generate leads on social media, get people to contact you, how do I follow up, how do I give a proposal, how do I close it? Your marketing should be in support of sales in the beginning, not for some egotistical process. It all needs to be supporting the sales process because that's how you're going to scale your business, is revenue generation. Okay? And then lastly, you're going to want to drive key metrics to improve conversion via data. You know what conversion is? I get 100 people who click on my website. 10 of them say contact me. Five of them ask for a proposal. One of them gives me an order. So my sales conversion is one out of five. My lead conversion is 10 out of 100 or whatever it is. So you want to know that to know how many people do I need to contact if I need 10 customers this quarter. You can do backwards math and say if I need 10 customers and only 20% of them buy, 
I need five times that. It means I need 50 proposals out. If I only, if for only, for every 100 customers, only 10 is proposal, that means I need to contact 5,000 people to get 50, I did the math wrong, 500 customers to get 50 proposals to get um, 10 customers this month. You can do that math real quickly and realize, holy moly, I gotta find a lot of people and talk to a lot of people. So that's what we mean by metrics and conversion. Questions, thoughts? Am I going too fast? Am I talking too loud? Okay. So let's talk about ideal customer profile and look at our first exercise. This is where you have a persona and a deep description sort of along the lines I was describing and Liz will go into depth. You want to understand the needs you're solving, how do you reach them, what services fit their needs. This is really the clarifying, crystallizing in your mind. Who am I really going after? And ideally, with characteristics, I can find out in the real world. If it's all psychographic, meaning they like purple flowers, how in the world am I going to find people who like purple flowers if that's in their head? Now, you may have a method, you know, <laughs> you know, but my point is some of these characteristics need to be from the kind of real world stuff, age, gender, location, income, etc. But Liz is going to go further with the workshop on going deeper beyond that using design thinking, okay? Another way to think about it, if you're in business already, is who gives you five-star reviews? Who's a repeat customer? Who refers friends and associates? Who's easy to serve, not your handy ass customer? And who's a profitable customer? You could get a huge customer and not make any money and say, I want more of those. And then you realize, wait, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't want big, unprofitable customers just because they dangle a big character for me. Right? Maybe you want small customers who are easy to serve, <coughs> quick in and out, not custom. I'm just making this up. I can do a repeatable process. I can make more money serving the mid-market than the high-end market. Or if your secret sauce says, I only do exclusive custom designs, you charge a premium for it, and you get that kind of money, whatever Melissa wants to do. But these are kind of external indicators of what a good ideal customer might look like if you've already got customers. Easy to serve and makes money, okay? So now we're going to turn it over to Liz for our first exercise.